So welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming out uh, on the East Coast. It is a cold rainy night here. Um, I am Ann Thompson. My, I am the head of adult services at the Essex Library and I want to welcome all of you and we're welcoming Takashi Yanai tonight. He is joining us from the West Coast in LA and we have a number of other guests honored guests with us who are also from the West Coast, but up north in Seattle um, and some other places around the country as well. So please um, take a moment. I'm gonna ask uh, for a few housekeeping rules that you mute yourself while Takashi is speaking. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll hold them for the end for a Q and A at the end. Um, and if you don't mind also turn off your cameras, your videos, um, and we will proceed with a very clean, hopefully, signal through the evening. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Takashi personally, but I'm going to have Jim Childress, partner at Centerbrook Architects, introduce Takashi tonight for us. So take it away, Jim. Thanks, Ann. Takashi, delighted you're here. We've wanted you to come back for this for a long time. That's a great part of Zoom, because it, uh, it doesn't have to be a three-day commitment to do this. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate it. Um, I, we're in our 13th year of this lecture series. Um, it's special to have you here. He, uh, Takashi's got a literature degree from Berkeley, which for an architect, I think that's very cool. He can, he can write and is articulate and thoughtful in a literary way. He's got a master's in architecture from Harvard, and he went to be a design journalist uh, with GA in Tokyo. And you know, the GA magazine is kind of the, the classic, just gorgeous. Um, um, group of books um, that, uh, and magazines that, that look at uh, world architecture and design. His practice is in LA and San Francisco um, uh, with his three partners, including his wife, Patty, who he met at Harvard. Um, and his firm won the AIA National Firm Award, I think in 2016. And he got his uh, fellowship in design from the American Institute of Architects in 2017 and he's the chair of the uh, National Committee on Design next year. Um, assuming next year is happening, maybe it'll be the year after, um, but he's clearly on a roll. Um, if you go look at his website, they're all really LA hip. Um, very cool people, but the thing that's endearing to me is they're all smiling. They're very kind, like really talented people, just very nice people. And I'd say lastly, go check out uh, his Instagram account. Uh, it's on art and design. He has 57,000 followers, I think, as of last count. Um, maybe it's the journalism background, the interest, whatever, but it's, uh, it's really inspiring and great fun to follow. Takashi, thank you very much for coming. Take it away. All righty. Well, thanks, Jim, for that very, very gracious intro. So thank you, Anne, and everyone at Essex Library and Jim and Centerbrook for supporting this lecture series. I think it's pretty amazing what you guys are doing. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming out to um, hear what um, I have to say. So hopefully I don't disappoint. Um, so as Jim mentioned, uh, I am Takashi and I am partner and residential studio director at Ehrlich and I Cheney Architects. Um, we're a 50 person firm. We're based in LA and San Francisco. Uh, we work in the modern idiom on projects across a broad range of scales, budgets and types. But I'm the director of the residential studio. And uh, so today I'm going to focus a little bit more on the residential work. And we're gonna look at it through this lens of outside in. So what does that mean? That means um, literally we're talking about bringing the outside in. Uh, it's blurring the boundaries between indoors and outdoors. And Sorry, we get to do that in California because we're spoiled by our climate. So it's pulling the landscape into the environment, into the interior environment of the house. Um, the other aspect of it, however, is that we're bringing outside influences and cultures into the work. So it's kind of a anthropological approach to architecture. So we are encouraged to you know, take those lessons and inspirations um, through our experiences and travels. For me, this means Japan where I was born actually and where I often go for inspiration. So these images come from uh, a fairly recent, not in 2020, but in 2019 visit to Japan, uh, some moss gardens in Kyoto 
um, and some modern Zen gardens by Mire Shigemori. Um, but fortunately, we don't have to go too far. So this is a hike that did occur in 2020 in this strange world that we currently find ourselves living in, in Marin County. Um, so it's not necessarily about bringing outside influence through cultures of faraway places, but I think that sort of inspiration can be found close at hand. Culture and influence is there to be explored and mined uh, in any project and in any location. I also wanted to, before I got into the projects, uh, share a little bit about our studio culture. So this is our LA office. Um, it's a single open studio. Um, it kind of looks like this right now. There's nobody in it. There are fewer people there now than they are in this photo, unfortunately, but it is this wonderful single light airy space. Uh, the building is just over a hundred years old. It was a dance hall previously. We converted it into our studio. And under normal circumstances, it is a great mixing chamber uh, that allows us to leverage the collective talents and energy of the entire staff. We have a very diverse staff across all generations. So it's a great place to cross pollinate across a diverse studio, across project types, scales, budgets, et cetera. And um, for those architects in the audience and for those who know the profession, you all know that um, at least in the alternate universe we lived in before 2020, the lights would stay on late into the night when deadlines loomed. And some of us even look back on that a little bit nostalgically. Um, and when my kids, when they were smaller, they would ask where I would be late at night. And I tell them, well, you know, there are deadlines at the office. So this was my son's drawing of a deadline. Um, so that was what was running in his head when we were all performing architecture at the office late at night. So anyway, the deadline has kind of become the office mascot. It's the the, the team name for our softball team. And again, not this year, but nostalgically looking back at 2019, we happened to be the architecture softball league champions. Now, getting into the work a little, another defining component of our practice is that we're located in Los Angeles, or at least we started out in Los Angeles. So for me, Los Angeles is a city of houses. There are over a half million houses here. It's 85% zoned for single family dwellings. Um, it is where young architects have traditionally come to cut their teeth and, and hone their craft. Uh, so that goes for architects that um, planted the seeds of modernism in California, whether that's Rudolf Schindler, Richard Neutra, to the Eames to Frank Gehry. So this is Frank Gehry's little punk rock transformation of a pink colonial, Dutch colonial in Santa Monica that I happened to walk past every day as a grade schooler in 1978. So there's been this long legacy of single family architectural practice here. And that architecture of habitation has always been a fascination of mine. So ever since I can remember being a kid, wanting to become an architect someday, it was specifically about being an architect uh, that focused on houses. As we look at the shot of this tiny apartment in Kisho Kurokawa's uh, capsule hotel in, in Tokyo. So our work now of our studio has several common threads. It's, re it's modern, as I mentioned before, but it is simple. Uh, in it, it's as simple as I would say is, is necessary but it's no simpler. Um, here's a composition of materials for a house we did in Santa Cruz. We felt that this was appropriate for this casual beach community. Some close-ups, a directness of the use of materials and details. Always seeking to introduce light and air. An attention to the views, no matter what the space. And another thing that um, we do is we like to focus sometimes on a particular architectural element, such as a 30 inch thick poured in place concrete wall here in model. 
and here under construction. So this is a house in Palo Alto. And uh, we conceived of this wall as a wall of poured stone. So it's the anchor of the project's material palette. And it's also an organizing element that runs the length of the house. You see it on the right-hand side. And it's embedded with shelving and built-ins to accommodate the owner's collections and lifestyle. And sometimes it provides a horizontal surface for art. And sometimes it's a threshold between rooms or spaces. Um, this is one of my favorite shots where we're actually standing outside, looking through the dining room, through the concrete wall and the stair tower and out to the backyard. And sometimes it's just sculpture poured out of stone or concrete. So now I wanted to share a few projects a little bit more in depth. Uh, this is a, a seascape photograph by the artist Hiroshi Sugimoto. It's sort of a touchstone of mine. Um, so this project is all about the Pacific Ocean and it's actually a renovation project. And uh, more frequently these days we've been taking on renovations but at the time we took this on, this was a few years ago, more than a few years ago, we really hadn't done renovations in quite a while, but the view was just too good to pass up. And uh, we felt that the, the house that was standing on the site just was not doing the site justice. So we felt that we had to intervene. So the existing house is, is pretty plain. It's not super inspiring, but it's very basic. Um, and we actually didn't add a single square foot to the house. Our, bot, our, our budget was very modest. So instead we made it uh, an exercise in editing. We made the architectural as simple as was practical, but no simpler, just a backdrop for the clients and a point of reference in nature. As I mentioned, we didn't add a single square foot. It was just a matter of, of reduction. So we wanted to make this entry procession unfolding landscape experience as you come away from the sidewalk from the city. Um, so it kind of takes you away from the world outside. We created this beach boardwalk kind of approach with this board form concrete baffle to delay the reveal of the Pacific Ocean. And as you walk up the basic forms emerge, it's climate appropriate landscaping, minimal forms, very blank minimal entry door. In fact, it, there's no hardware on it. It's a final pause before entry. And this is what the original porch looked like. So we took away this trellis and we opened it up and we reimagined it as a sort of California version of a Japanese contemplative courtyard or kind of desert Zen garden. So this is the pause before you enter the house. So even before you've been offered a, the view in full, you get a little glimpse of the light and air beyond. This is what the house looked like previously. It was um, kind of a, 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 an odd collection of rooms. It was previously a living room, a dining room, a family room, a study. There was a kitchen, of course, a powder room and a laundry room. So there were seven or eight rooms. So what we did is we removed all the interior walls and we combined everything into a single flowing space and opened it up to the view. The exterior wall was completely eliminated and we replaced it by sliding glass doors that pocket away completely. So it's essentially covered outdoor space. The deck and pool are set at interior floor level. So there's a continuous plane that extends into the landscape. And as I mentioned before, the house was on a relatively modest budget. So we kept the detailing very simple. So the materials are very basic, but we concentrated a little bit of the materiality and details into these very discrete locations. So here you see these teak niches that kind of define the TV and the fireplace, and then also the portal that takes you to the bedroom wing. So in the end, it creates a frame for the view, and it's also a vessel for the owner's art and belongings. 
And it's a stage set for the lives that go on and unfold within. Um, because with a view like this, I think the architecture should stay out of the way. So back to California for a second and this sort of idea of bringing in outside influences. So as I mentioned, I was born in Japan and for me, the uh, California is sort of a confluence between East and West. I see this um, expression of trying to jump the cultural divide in the design of our environments. Um, so I'm constantly conscious of like evidence of this dialogue around me. So this is California scenario, for example, by Isamu Noguchi in Costa Mesa. It's a, this corporate uh, plaza, but it's this really wonderful landscape. And it's his take on, um, it's his take on a Zen garden that's appropriate for California. And I see shades of um, a humble tea house or the majesty of Katsura Villa in Kyoto in Rudolf Schindler's King's Road house. So this is a house that was built in the early 20th century. This was Rudolf Schindler's first house that he had built or designed after he had left Frank Lloyd Wright's studio in Los Angeles. And uh, you can obviously, you can see the Japanese influence and that to me is fascinating because at this point in his career, Schindler had not been to Japan. However, Frank Lloyd Wright was traveling back and forth from LA to Japan working on the Imperial Hotel. And he would come back in this, I'm just hypothesizing, come back and um, telling stories of his visits and the things he had seen. So you see that essence of, of Katsura captured here in this photograph by uh, Yasuhiro Ishimoto. Um, and Walter Gropius, who was the founder of the GSD. He is a European architect that uh, is kind of the fathers of modernism in the US. He made the argument that Katsura in particular was a pivotal inflection point between traditional Japanese architecture and modernism. And you can see his point. You see like that connection between interior and exterior space. You see the transformability of the space through these shoji, the sliding doors. Um, and so when you go to the Schindler house, for example, and you squint, you definitely see that. So these are photographs by Hiroshi Sugimoto again, one of my favorite artists. So he studied art in, uh, at the art center, not too far away uh, from the Schindler Kings Road house. So these are early photos he had taken. And his whole idea was to take photographs of architecture or architectural space with um, an unfocused lens. So the idea is that by doing that, you're really distilling the architecture to its essence. And when I look at these, I think of, in particular, this essay by um, an SAS Jun Ichiro Tanizaki in, in Praise of Shadows, maybe some of you know it, um, that speaks about the, the role of art, of light and material and shadow in particular in architecture. So I like to read into these relationships. So for instance, whenever I see an Eames house bird on the right, I immediately think of a Matsuo Basho haiku. Um, who knows if that intersection is real or not, but it is real for me. So, I try to take some of these elements that I see as being unique, but you know, um, I would say relevant and, and, and even profound in Japanese architecture and kind of introduce them into our projects, sometimes more explicitly than other times. So this, for instance, is what we call a tokonoma. It's an art niche. It's an opportunity for people to display their collection. There's usually a flower arrangement. There's usually a scroll with a philosophical quote or a poem that speaks to the season or the occasion. So this is uh, our, our sort of version of a tokonoma. So this is a, you know, the media wall of this particular project. So it's embedded within this board formed wall. And it likewise is an opportunity for this uh, homeowner to sort of um, put on display, um, you know, evidence of the kinds of things that they are drawn to, whether they're 
books or planting or art or things that they've picked up in their travels. It's a little close up. So this is an interesting photograph. This was actually taken during construction um, on a house that I'm about to show you in Palo Alto. So this was uh, just the rough framing. The level of craft in Palo Alto is quite remarkable. Um, and I love working in this part of the country because the builders are really, really do care about craft. And so this was a little tokonoma that the framers had created for themselves. I did not plant that vase of flowers. One of the workers had, and they fully knew that, you know, within weeks that there would be electrical and plumbing and eventually insulation and drywall covering up this framing. But in the meantime, they had created this little display alcove because the job site um, was their home. So that segues to this house. It's called the Waverly Residence. Um, I was excited to work on this project because I knew of the very, very high level of craft in the area. Uh, so for instance, the masons who installed this beautiful handmade brick. Um, so in that spirit, this house, the Waverly Residence became this um, meditation, architectural me meditation of craftsmanship and materiality. And also there's this very forward um, relationship between the materiality of the house and the landscape. And I'm not sure if an image like this comes up later on. So um, I'll mention that um, in this case, we specifically wanted to have ginkgo trees because um, the once a year where the leaves turn yellow like this for a couple of weeks, uh, the yellow picks up this sort of residual ochre color in the bricks, the flash of ochre in the bricks, and it, it's quite stunning. So the house is a compound. There's a front house and a back house, and they're linked by this covered walk to create this compound. In the feature we wanted to really celebrate on this site were the mature oak trees. Um, so again, you know, we're trying to reach for that um, conversation between the architecture and the culture of the place. So I mentioned already the craftsmanship of the builders, but also, you know, the culture of this specific site was very much tied to these mature oaks. Simple moves and materials that are meant to be quiet and enhance what's already there and respond to the landscape. Composition of forms and materials. And on the interiors, the spaces flow from indoors to outdoors. So the materials extend from inside to outside, the wood going from inside to outside and vice versa. The brick is coming from the exterior of the house to the interior. We developed a very sort of finite palette, but really wanted to concentrate on the richness of the craft and materiality. Here it's a uh, teak and bronze, the brick is brought in, custom cabinets of course, in this case on the right a medicine cabinet, uh, and teak and bronze, all of it interacting with the light. And then we also designed this deployable metal curtain as a screen between the kitchen and dining for dinner parties. So you might imagine that they're setting up in the kitchen or there's a caterer or a bartender or something. This would be sort of this dramatic veil in between. Um, and we were very careful about how we studied the degree density of the metal mesh and how the light interacted with it. So we imagined that this in a way was a way the architecture was mimicking the quality of the light that came through the leaves of the oak tree outside, the dappled light. And the stair tower links three levels. Um, the stairs are always a sculptural feature in our work. So the staircase is someplace where you can view out, but also you're being viewed from outside. Some concrete, stone, and glass, some brick also. And it leads to the basement guest room and courtyard. 
We had fun with the stringer, the zigzag stringer. And these wide treads at the bottom of each run can, uh, can double as seating for, for entertaining. Always mindful of materials and light. And at top, you are led to the client's office. So glass walls amidst the canopy of trees, uh, mature trees in Palo Alto are, are quite beautiful. So it really feels like you're amongst the canopy and you're in this tree house. And then lastly, we have this rooftop deck that where you can sit cozily underneath the oak canopy. So again, simple forms, materials that resonate with the context in this outdoor room underneath the oaks. That kind of sums up this project. So this next project is quite interesting as well. It's kind of a merging of art and architecture. As you can tell that I draw a lot of inspiration from, from, from art. And, um, and uh, so, so in this case, we got to have this dialogue that was a little bit more explicit because this was a collaboration with an artist, Johannes Giordoni, who practices in the tradition of Terrell, uh, light and space art. It is meant down, it's meant to uh, break down the boundaries between art and architecture to go beyond how art can just be placed in architecture. Um, so it starts with these very simple forms and materials. We use the white stucco and black shosugiban, which are, uh, it's a Japanese technique, burnt cedar boards. Uh, it's a traditional material that uh, now is being produced artisanally in, in the US as well. Um, and the house is ultimately about color. Johannes's art is about color. So we felt that it was appropriate. The, the architecture was all about whiteness, which is the combination of all colors and light and blackness, which is the absence of all colors. So in particular, we really liked this burnt wood because it really sucked all the light out of the air, um, the way that the, the finish worked. So it is also about framing views and apertures. So even on this small infill lot in Venice, um, we're able to capture the sense of space. So that is the Corten wall right at the sidewalk, again, blurring um, um, that distinction between indoors and outdoors to the extent that we can think of that courtyard as an outdoor room. And then the way that the uh, artist um, and his wife furnished the house you could think of the interior as like an interior landscape. Here, a little view of how we bring the exterior material into the house. And on the ground floor, there's this easy sense of flow between the pavilions. The house, the party is three pavilions. So there are views that pass through interior and exterior spaces. So we're actually looking through a void and then another room and then the courtyard outside. And then also the shadows of the landscaping creates like this other moving, living aspect to the architecture. A view from the reverse direction from the alley through the art studio and courtyard. And then upstairs, uh, there's the bridge element where art and architecture merge. So here you see it at the, uh, you see Johannes walking, um, emerging from the bridge and coming into the art lounge. So you're starting to get a sense of the bridge as you come from the master bedroom. So this is the bridge itself. This is an exterior shot from the courtyard outside the kitchen. But it's at night when the building truly transforms. Um, the bridge is a light and space sculpture unto itself, a light and space installation. It, it is on this 24-hour, uh, 365 day a year program that uh, modulates the levels of light and the colors. So during the day, you get a little hint of it uh, on the outline of the door jam upstairs at the top of the bridge, but at night, the colors can really sort of um, permeate the house, um, if you will. 
So the performance um, can be seen from the neighbors. Uh, it changes constantly. It's coordinated with the time of day and the time of year. The colors grow more intense at night. This is the art lounge again at night. The art lounge experience, no need for TV. And as you pass through it, you feel yourself in relation to all of this, meaning um, at night, the house starts to fall away. The art becomes a little bit more intense. It becomes a much more in immersive environment, much more of an art piece. But I actually like this condition, which is sort of a middle ground condition. This is a magic moment for me between the art and the architecture where the art grounds you in time and place. So this becomes a, sort of a, a lens through which you not only recognize your own house, but you start to see the neighborhood. You see the roofs of the bungalows in Venice to either side of you. You can see the sky. You kind of get a sense of the time of day, the time of year, it grounds you in time and place. So that Jim mentioned now as a literature major. So I'm going to uh, indulge him a little bit or torture him, I, I'm not sure. So, so that often okay. makes me think of a, a, a poem by Wallace Stevens, it's called Anecdote of a Jar. And it kind of summarizes a, you know, kind of a, a way I look at architecture. I'm gonna recite it for you folks. It goes like this. I placed a jar in Tennessee and round it was upon a hill that made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill. The wilderness rose up to it and sprawled around no longer wild. The jar was round upon the ground and tall and of a port and air. It took dominion everywhere. The jar was gray and bare and it did not give a bird or bush like nothing else in Tennessee. So for me, that act of setting this jar, this object in the landscape is about creating a frame of reference. And it's against this frame of reference that we can begin to measure our place in the world. So for instance, the Farnsworth house in the woods outside of Chicago. And at the same time, the jar is a vessel and the jar in that illustrated the poem happened to be empty and it is without meaning until it is filled. Like the furniture, the books, the objects, all the memories that fill the living space of the Eames house in Santa Monica. So in that same way, I like to think of architecture as a way to measure the passing of time and seasons and place in this abstract way. And architecture becomes a lens through which to understand our context, deliberately cited in response to the land, to create a point of reference to understand the site at different times of day, different times of year. It frames and reveals changes in the natural environment and it mediates between people and place. So that brings us to the last project I'm going to share with everyone tonight. This is called Spring Road. It's in Marin County, which is just across the, the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco, just north. Um, and it was a lot about creating this private spot for living and working for this client. Um, that was the program. But for me, it was about creating this location on this planet that kind of gave him a grounding place. And, really provided architectural meaning um, for his life. So this is a shot as you come up the motor court and you kind of see Mount Tam, uh, which might be the main scenic protagonist, let's call him or her um, in the background on the right. And the composition is very simple and direct. It's not fussy. Um, it's meant to be beautiful and elegant, of course, but ultimately it's a backdrop. The color of terracotta, for instance, was selected to respond and blend to the color of the bark of the trees. And as you approach the entry court by now, you recognize this idea that we like of extending that procession as you get to the front door. So the landscape and design, landscape design and layered experience helps kind of slowly bring you as a segue into the house. And once you enter, again, we like to sort of choreograph the views. Um, again, we're placing you in the landscape. This is directed toward the view of San Francisco. You can maybe kind of see it. You can barely see it on my screen at least, but it's there, believe me. 
the materials slide in from outside to inside. Again, we're doing these things to sort of, you know, blur the boundaries between indoors and outdoors. You'll notice how the edge of the sky, there's a skylight there. We pulled the edge of the ceiling in a couple feet so that um, that glass line is even kind of blurring that, that definition between interior and exterior space. And from the entry, you come into the main space, the main living space, the main living area is sunken. It has this wood floor. It stretches out to the view via the deck. And the wood floor ties very naturally into this wooden deck. So I think of the two combined as a wood carpet. And again, it's suggesting that the room is both inside and outside. It's not room and then deck. It's both combined as a room. The view of the entry foyer from the reverse. Um, you see again the architecture is this meditation on craft and materiality. We used uh, walnut, the terracotta from outside, and the concrete, and also we introduced this blackened steel to uh, create these accents throughout the house. So he's a uh, single without kids. So the upstairs is a single open master suite. Uh, we combined a home office area overlooking the stair, the dressing and closet area. Uh, the client happens to have an extensive wardrobe. In the view the other way toward the bed bedroom area, there is a pocketing door that probably has never been shut, but you can see again that it, it's about framing views. And those views are always oriented toward our main protagonist, Mount Tam. A view from the master deck, we're looking at the gym and office areas, the house and the redwood context. So the house is a backdrop for the client's activities and frame the landscape. So this is a view from his office. He, he has a business that he actually um, operates out of the home. So this is his office. He does have employees come here. Um, so it's a framing device. Um, and the pool is also a reflector. The pool is a reflector of the landscape. So it's kind of a, a window, if you will. It's an infinite mirror that expands the landscape. And again, the composition sort of forced the house into the periphery. This black water feature in the middle happens to be a spa, but more than that, it reminds me of uh, well, like an art piece, but it reminds me specifically of the monolith from, from Stanley Kubrick's Space Odyssey 2001. It kind of marks the dawning of man. In a way, it's, it's the center of the entire project. So once again, this piece here is, is the jar that I spoke about a moment ago. ago. It gives order to uh, the wilderness. It creates a point of reference for the client and his work and his life and it marks time, it marks the seasons, all against Mount Tam and Marin County, San Francisco beyond, in California, and um, in the universe, quite frankly, why not? Um, and uh, that's, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. That's fabulous, Takashi. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to go ahead and open it up to questions if you have one. I know there was one in the chat, so I will go ahead and read that off. She asks, uh, she's curious how earthquake requirements impact, especially as to limits the design. Earthquake, yes. Well, uh, yeah, earthquake something we have to deal with on the West Coast in California in particular. Um, I'm not sure I'm the one to ask. Um, well, we rely a lot on the advice of our engineers. So we have some basic, basic things that we do. Um, so there's a lot of steel in our work. So steel is more resilient in terms of resisting earthquake than, than wood frame. And then, um, yeah, we just have to plan accordingly. So that's one of the, the, the challenging, but kind of the fun aspects of architecture, like, you know, this chat today sort of focused on you know, maybe the more philosophical or, or poetic, but but there's also a, you know, a myriad of technical issues that we're having to deal with. So in California, seismic is certainly one, um, and energy is another one. And so energy is quite challenging because in our work, for instance, we really like to sort of dissolve that boundary, as I said, 
several times between the indoors and outdoors, which means using a lot of glass. And uh, you know that's slightly less energy efficient than having an insulated wall. So it's all it's all a balancing act, which means um, you just have to be all that much more deliberate and thoughtful about how you do these things. Yeah, great question. Nice. Uh, we also have another question. Um, Stephanie wants to know your thoughts on John Lautner. John Lautner, yes. Well, he's another you know. Um, forefather, I guess. I mean, in California, we're really spoiled. I mean, the whole country is spoiled, but Los Angeles, specifically in residential architecture, we're very spoiled by, you know, a tremendous pantheon of masters, and John Lautner was certainly one of them. If, if you have not visited LA, and um, while you're able to, I would highly, highly advise finagling your way into the Goldstein Sheets residence by Lautner, so that one is owned by James Goldstein, who's getting up there in age, but he is, you know, I believe he made his fortune in real estate. And um, he, he kind of recreated a Lautner house, meaning he bought a Lautner house, which was already quite remarkable. And the house was never built to the specification and to the um, expectations of the architect of John Lautner and James Goldstein made it his life's mission really to build the house that John Lautner intended to have built and uh, that's what he lives in now and he's even expanded upon it he's engaged John Lautner's um, um, you know employees like people who used to work with John to um, create like additional buildings on the site um, but it's quite, quite remarkable. Yes, that, you know, there's the, um, you know, not quite maybe in the legacy of, of Schindler and Neutra, but certainly Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, so he, he came at a time where, you know, there was like this confluence of maybe the more, um, what would I call them, uh, rigorous or, or um, yeah, I guess rigorous would be the word, um, um, aspect of mid-century modern that came out of European international style modernism from the East Coast. So you have, it's more rectilinear and very logical in terms of like the structure that Lautner brought to that indoor outdoor sensibility that we were able to expand upon um, in the West Coast and took it to this whole other level of poetics. And he was able to do that by understanding also the materials that he was able to work with concrete and steel. So they're much more exuberant, say, than, than Neutra or Schindler. Um, you know, I think he owes a lot to those masters, but uh, yes, uh, one, one, one of the masters for sure. So a hero, another hero. This is a bit tangential to that. Uh, Howard wants to know what current architects, other than in your own firm, do you find particularly skillful, inspiring, or interesting? Hmm. Current heroes, I guess. Current heroes, yeah. Okay, that's a long list. I mean, there's so many amazing architects out there, including Robert Miller, who's in the audience, and Jim Childress, who introduced me. Um, some favorites. So if you were to go, if, if you were to expand to the world, you know, I think Peter Zimthor is, 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 a, is a huge favorite of mine. Like he, he's very... I mean, I think he's a master of light and material, and somehow he's fortunate enough to say no to probably 99 projects before he accepts one. So each one is like quite magical. And uh, in LA, he has designed the new LA County Museum of Art, which is currently, it's not quite under construction, but the old museums have been demoed. So I'm looking forward to that. It's a controversial project. And it's at a scale that he has yet to build that, but I have all the confidence in the world that it'll be a beautiful project. Um, I'm a glass half full kind of person, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, Sana Sejima out of Japan, she is also a favorite. There's a certain lightness to it. And so it definitely doesn't look um, traditionally Japanese, but I think it is very traditionally Japanese. So if architecture is this dialogue between buildings and people throughout the centuries, 
and Bruno Taut and Gropius were looking at Katsura and they became proponents of the international style. I think she's taking that sort of distilled language of the international style, like basically, you know, slender metal components and glass and reinterpreting it in a very sort of, I don't know, um, minimal way, like not that dissimilar from like a haiku. I mean, they're very gestural and very minimal and they're distinctly Japanese, but I think they're quite interesting fusions of that sort of two worlds. And then locally, up and comers, I think they're beyond up and comers now, they, they've arrived, but Johnson Markley, uh, they do tremendous work. So they just you know recently opened the new drawing pavilion at the Menil um, in Houston, a remarkable project. But what really drew me to them early on is um, they have a series of these really wonderful houses that they did in LA that um, are, are very different, very unique. I mean, they have like this very interesting point of view, you know, so thank you for the compliment. Like I like the work we do too, but there are, there are a lot of talented architects out there. Um, but, you know, sometimes we fall into like familiar tropes and familiar vocabularies. Um, and so there's, there's an endless supply of excellent residential work out there to choose from, but I feel like their work is bringing something very unique and fresh to the table. So I, I admire their work. There's a gorgeous sauna building here in Connecticut for those. Local. I know. Grace Farms, it's, it's Grace open Farms. to the public. Yes. It's worth, it's worth the trip. Yes. Can I stay in your guest room? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's really worth visiting if none of you have gone to see it. So. Yeah. It's Next question. A uh, we have a, a bunch of questions uh, waiting. Um, we'll one more, and then we have somebody with a hand raised. Uh, I think of architecture as very much a collaborative art. How do you get the creative juices flowing among your employees when everyone's working from home? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I mean, we were chit-chatting about this before the lecture started. Yeah, one of the silver linings, I mean, there have been many challenges and, um, you know, we've been really fortunate to stay productive during this time. Um, but one of the silver linings is that through the technology, I have been able to, in some cases, interact with my staff and my studio even more than I had before. Um, that, yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know. It's just a matter of conversing. So um, the teams with which I'm better able to have that sort of inspiring conversation are the teams that are, you know, open-minded and like to go sideways sometimes and, you know, entertain or put up with me like reading a poem or, <laughs> or you know, I, I'll inquire, um, you know, what they're up to. And actually, I would say social media has played a role in that. So there are certain people in the office that have um, robust social media accounts. And those accounts, you know, whether it's Facebook or, or Instagram, they give you like this insight into a person that you don't necessarily have at work, like in a work setting. And so that becomes like a launching point for a conversation and before you know it, that's had some sort of impact on a project in a way that you didn't anticipate. Do you, uh, in the office within EYRC, do you end up with uh, small friendly competitions or are there specific um, well, yeah. uh, attributes of a project that you might throw open to the firm as a, not a competition necessarily, but sort of an open, open field for design? Yeah, we have done that in the past. Um, yeah, it's interesting you brought that up. Yes, so so during COVID, we've done that a little bit more frequently where, you know, we'll have a small project and it's probably not even a wise or a sound business decision, but we'll do like a mini charrette. And part of it is that, you know, it's, the project is small enough, like a tea house or like what we call an ADU. I guess you guys have ADUs or is that a California thing? Accessory dwelling unit. It's like a smaller residence. So I feel like 
well, someone can get their mind around this in a few hours. So why don't we spend an afternoon or a day or a couple days as a group? And it won't be a competition, but it's sort of like a, an ideas charrette, you know, where we're just coming up with ideas and then we'll do a pinup virtually. And um, that's been really successful. And I would have to say the definite positive byproduct of that in addition to getting a lot of great ideas out there quickly has been that it's been fun for people to interact with each other in that way. Um, so, so I tried that once and it was great. And so I've been trying to weave that in as, um, as I'm able to. Okay. Ilsa, you've been very patient. Uh, if you want to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Here in Centerbrook, um, I'm an architect within a couple of miles of Centerbrook's office. We in New England face all these problems of the climate and glass is not an option when you're considering uh, any kind of environmental uh, heating controls with I always love the residents of uh, the West Coast with Schindler and the Green Brothers and Maybeck and those people who could work with their environment and not consider what they were doing to the climate as much as we have to in this environment in New England. Mm -hmm. um, you are always saying you bring, uh, like to bring the outside in, and yet here and there we have these small lots where you don't want to bring your neighbor's environment into your home, and you know it's been a curse of uh, of architects all their lives of of building on single family lots. And everything is, and and yet when I went to Kyoto, I found that they were able to live close together and bring uh, each other's environment into their own in a in a very special way through their gardens, mm -hmm. and I feel that landscape architecture is as much a part of our existence as architecture because we have to live outdoors and be comfortable there. Can you give a recommendation to us here in the East Coast into New England that architects can uh, adapt to those kind of philosophies better? Yeah. That's a great question. I love that question. I wish I you, I'd gotten that question in advance of preparing the presentation because there would there would be other images I would love to share. This is the one. This is one that popped into my head. Um, so I think I'm still sharing my screen, but this is an, a, a house on an infill lot, um, and so their house is side by side, and so we wanted to introduce light and air and some greenery into this experience of a top of a stair landing. So this is at the top of a stair landing. It's a little, you know, maybe it's like a little meditative spot or a, a reading platform. Um, but instead of doing a window, and if we had done a window, we would be staring into the bedroom of the two-story house next door. We, we did this outdoor courtyard. So it was a little sky court. You know, we placed it just so like we have, you know, now technology is so wonderful. We know exactly where the sun is going to track any time of year. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a compositional opportunity, you know, with the plant, it's a Palo Verde tree in a pot, but it also gives you this connection to what's going on outside. You see the sky and you know what the weather is like that day. And we're close enough to the ocean, believe it or not, and I could be imagining things because I grew up in Santa Monica, so I believe these things. But I, I think you can sense the ocean, even though it's probably still a good mile and a half away. 
Um, so this is one strategy. We did, we did a house in Houston, which is, um, I don't have an image of, but we obviously can't make the walls disappear like we can in the Pacific Palisades. The, the climate does, does not allow for that, but we created pavilions that had sort of these beautiful gardens on both sides of glass walls that don't necessarily open to that extent, but you felt that you were in a covered outdoor space. And then beyond the gardens, we would have tall walls. So you're still protected in terms of the view from, let's say even the homeowners or their guests pulling up in their cars or their neighbors. Um, so it's, it's, it's a matter of like sort of trying to create those opportunities where you feel that you can connect to nature and sun and light and greenery and your place in the world, but also, you know, balance that with the need for privacy, especially in these smaller infill lots. So even in the smallest infill lots, well, like if you go to, sorry, and I totally agree with you. My favorite, you know, a lot of people think that our favorite collaborator, and I love any sort of collaboration, is with the interior designer. But for me, absolutely, it is the landscape architect. So in California, we're blessed with having a lot of great landscape architects. What was I looking for? Oh yeah, now I remember. Um, so in each project, you know, I think pretty hard about who would be the right landscape architectural partner. And then it's it's a great dialogue um, between between the two teams to find that right combination of like in this case, the landscape architect was uh, Eric and, and Sylvina Blazon out of Marin County. So they, they helped kind of come up with that idea of ginkgo trees in the front, which was great. So this house is a Venice house. It's very small, um, but we created like these, and I don't mind seeing the neighbors, especially in this particular situation, but instead of most of the developer houses or new houses you see in this neighborhood, max it out just because it costs so much to, first buy the land and build. But especially in California, you realize that outdoor space when it's well designed is as good as indoor space. So we make sure not to do that. We create these sort of outdoor rooms. So that's right up against the sidewalk. And you can probably hear conversations of people walking by, but that's part of living in an urban environment. Um, so it's like that right mix of you know, if they're not walking by, this is this is a beautiful, peaceful setting where you feel like you're indoors and outdoors. And you can imagine in a cold, colder climate, you could achieve something like this by having um, an expansive windows that don't necessarily open. So likewise, you know, as you meander through the house, it's not just one deep room, but a series of smaller courtyards that interact with the pavilions of the house. I don't know if that begins to answer your question, but uh, um, I agree with you. Like there, there are many great lessons to be had from architects in, in Japan. I mean, I'm biased maybe, but um, people think I'm crazy when, when I say that some of the best re residential architecture is being done in Japan because, you know, you don't have like 10,000 square foot houses with, you know, 100 foot long infinity pools and, screening rooms and gyms and whatnot, but that doesn't necessarily make a great house. A great house might be 400 square feet. Um, and so it's one of the rare countries, if you look at the list of Pritzker prize winners, which is, that's like the Nobel prize of architects for those that might not know, you'll find there are quite a few Japanese architects who have achieved that level and they're still doing quite modest houses because it's important. Thanks. <laughs> kind of a rambling answer. <laughs> uh, every word is, uh, I'm listening to every single word, so <laughs> I hope everybody else is enjoying it as much as I am. Uh, we still have a few questions, uh, so bear with us, please. Um, uh, Christine wants to know if any of the properties you've designed have come under threat from wildfires. Yes. I mean, fortunately, we haven't had any actually burned down. I mean, I, I do have colleagues who've had amazing award-winning work kind of disappear overnight, which is just heartbreaking. Um, now I did, I did have a client 
who had a property burn and um, it wasn't, it wasn't what we had designed. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, especially this last round, you know, as we're all in sheltering in place, you know, a, a source of, of relief and respite for a lot of people living in the city in San Francisco, because it's so dense was to get outside the city and to be in Sonoma or Marin and, you know, I mean, not everyone is so fortunate to be able to do that, but some people were, and they were thinking about, well, you know, who, maybe I don't live in San Francisco at all, and I live out here full time, and then guess what, there is a wildfire, so they're, you know, they're coming back to the city, escaping that, so um, I haven't had that unfortunate situation, but that is a reality that we have to face, like California is facing a lot, you know, it's, it's not, it still has an amazing climate, but the climate is changing, absolutely. The fires are one of, one of the symptoms of that. Um, you know, there, there's the social inequities that are, you know, having, having tremendous um, adverse effects on, on urban living. And there are, a lot of, there are a lot of issues for architects to help, help tackle, so. Well, you mentioned social equity. The next question is, how do you reconcile social equity issues with the single family project type? It's true, you know, like I, I used, I love that slide still that I show early on with all the tracked houses. And I talk about how 85% of LA is, is zoned for single family dwelling. And um, it, I mean, that's a fact. And it's true that a lot of people like Neutra and Schindler and all those people got to cut their teeth and hone their craft in LA. But that's a problem. 85% zone for single family dwellings. That's, that's not good. That's an issue. One of the great things that happened in California in the last few years <laughs> is um, the introduction of the ADU. And so, you know, I think different neighborhoods have kind of embraced it in different ways. But in effect, the ADU, which is an accessory dwelling unit, and so that allows for any single family lot to have, in addition, an accessory dwelling unit of a relatively limited size, anywhere from, depending on the jurisdiction, 400 square feet to as large as 1,300 square feet, I've heard. That doubles, that is doubling the density, at least, you know? I mean, is that really going to, you know, is, is an ADU in Beverly Hills really going to impact the housing prices? No. But... Um, I think there is a lot of attention paid to um, uh, low-income housing. So, in fact, you know, that's that's for me as a residential architect. I'm very interested in that because I do realize as I get older, I'm impacting a very very small segment of the population. And it, you know, all my clients, they're lovely people and they earned everything, but and they're entitled to 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 what they have, but. Um, we are looking for ways to impact a larger public. And so we're wading into uh, multifamily. And it's interesting that um, a lot of the best work has been done in low cost housing because of the fact that they are subsidized and the fact that they are owned and operated by nonprofits. And so they're not driven by a bottom line per se because they realize that maintenance and upkeep and longevity um, is better for them operationally. So the quality of that work and the quality of the design oftentimes far exceeds the multi-million dollar condo projects, which I think is quite interesting to say the least. And it's very odd and problematic as well. So, interesting. yeah. Particularly in San Francisco or in the San Francisco area. Yeah. Um, we have another question. You referenced the importance of stairs in your designs. Can you share more about your thoughts about stairs and the importance of connecting levels? Ah, oh, that's an interesting question. Well, hmm. Well, just, I mean, at the most basic level, I think, you know, I talked about the idea of the jar and, 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 um, so I do believe that even when we had the budgets to sort of lavish onto the projects like these beautiful materials that the architecture shouldn't be overworked because that leaves not that much room for 
let's say the beautiful landscape or the changing of the seasons or the artwork and furniture and collections of the of the clients or for the clients and their kids and relatives and friends themselves to animate the space. But the stair is like a sculptural opportunity. And um, so we do, you know, I mean, selfishly, so we might divert like a higher percentage of the, instead of lavish it on say um, a decked out master closet maybe, or even the master bath, um, we try to make the stairs like sort of a installation slash performance piece. And oftentimes we like to program them. So they're not just about getting from level to level, like in the one house I showed, the stair is, um, um, it's a switchback stair, but on the first half of the run or the first run, the stairs are twice as wide. So at every level, you have extra wide stairs that you can sit at. So it's seating or you might place objects on it and it, you, there's still plenty of width to use it as a stair, but it's also this other thing. In another case, and I'm sorry, I don't have images to support these things. Um, it was a four level stair. There was a basement, two story house and a roof deck. So it's four levels. And this lovely couple, they loved collecting art and they, 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 um, they love collecting art on their travels and they had an amazing eye, but they loved, they didn't, they didn't abide by what people told them they should buy. They just bought what they loved. So they actually had more art than they could display. And so they had this art storage space in the basement, but the stair then became this gallery. So we had this great balance of wall space for the 2D art. And then we had this shelf that was kind of this ladder shelf that went ran all the way from the basement to the penthouse at the roof, four stories that allowed them to display this work. And so every time you went up and down the stairs, you were kind of in their gallery, in their personal museum. Um, and then what was the last bit of that question? Oh, what do I think about level change? Well, it's like, it's part of, it's part of the life of the house. So even in those instances where like on a flat infill lot, like that little kind of meditative spot at the top of the stair with that exterior courtyard, that image I showed. Um, that's just, a, that's a two story house on a flat lot. But instead of having a top of the stair that just led to bedroom um, doors, we created this little spot that didn't have a name, but you could either just lounge there or read a book or just do nothing. You just come up and you contemplate what a beautiful day it is or that fact that it's raining every time you come home and you come up those stairs. And I had to fight for that thing because the owners, they just wanted me to take it over to make their master closet bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I'm very accommodating as an architect because I know in the end, I'm not living there. The, 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 the clients are, it's their house. Um, but that was one where I, I threw a little bit of a fit to make sure we didn't lose that one. So the stairs are like an event, you know, and it's, it's part of your daily ritual. And so I think it should be celebrated, I guess would be my answer. Well, I applaud you're having the fit because I think they're, they're probably applauding that move as well. At yes. this point. They'd rather spend that time in that meditative position than uh, a few extra minutes in their closet. That's right. So, <laughs> well done, you. Um, I'm going to let Jim articulate his questions because he's he's got sort of three in three in one, and I don't want to overstep on what he's intending there. Oh, uh, a little esoteric, but the question is, I've seen some of these, and then from the photographs, you're really thinking three dimensionally, mm -hmm. but. But at the same time, I'm seeing a lot of two-dimensional composition. The classic photograph you had of, uh, you know, inside a, a Japanese house. I, I think it was the Katsura yeah. Palace, actually. With the, it's a very, it's three-dimensional. It's a very two-dimensional composition. I'm just curious how 2D versus 3D runs through your brain. How much are you thinking one way or the other? Wow, that is a great, that is a wonky, 
architect's question. I, know. <laughs> I, I didn't want to ask that after no, talking I, about I, I, uh, making yeah, housing well, more you, accessible. Yeah, well, you touched on, you know, the fact that I have a literary background. So that's definitely had like an impact on the way I think about the work. But I also, before I went to architecture school or before I was an English major, like an alternate career was photography. And uh, I mean, you mentioned my Instagram account. So I never became a photographer, but I think I've always been interested in 2D representation. And, you know, I'm, I'm of the generation where we didn't use the computer in school. We drew drawings, right? So I think, I think when you go back a little ways, like there were a lot, a lot of architects who sort of thought simultaneously in 2D and 3D you know, so absolutely, like the two dimensional represent or composition is important to me. And even like the 3D composition as it would be represented eventually in two dimensions in a photograph, for instance, is, uh, is important to me. So I'm always thinking about that court choreography, like where you come in to the site or what you're looking at when you open the front gate or the front door compositionally. So that might not be flat, two-dimensional, but it is in a way. Like if you were to capture that in a photograph, it would be two-dimensional. So, you know, you spin, you spin the thing around, like let's say in a model, right? Um, but there's certain views, like I often have staff members that show me renderings from a bird's eye view and it's a beautiful comp composition and they don't wanna give up on something. And I'm like, you know, in the end, that's not how we experience the space or the thing, the object. So I am always thinking about how things appear. So that's, you know, that's, I re I'm, as I'm saying that, I realize that that's a little bit counter to this idea of that architecture is in the background and a vessel. So I guess those things like are happening simultaneously along with seismic, and energy considerations and all that, yeah. Mm -hmm. all right. I think what I wanted to ask actually was, um, do you do any of the landscape architecture yourself and how much of the interiors uh, do you do in your projects or do you find the perfect person for that outside of EYRC? We don't do, we almost always insist on having a landscape architect um, we are we are doing a little project right now where we're going to try on our own. I mean, the reality is, and architects are guilty of this, and I can say this because I'm an architect, so I'm not insulting all the other architects who might be here, but we think we know better than everyone else, a lot, oftentimes, even if we don't admit it, like that's just in the architect's nature for some reason, I'm not sure why. But the reality is that plant material is, extensive and even furniture selection, there's so many choices, lighting design these days. It's so complicated. It's hard to be that master of everything that maybe we imagined architects could be at one point. And maybe they could never be that thing, but, but that myth is, you know, should just be tossed, right? And so, and I love it. I love um, collaborating with the landscape architects. And I also think it should be a collaboration because landscape architects, even the best ones who think they understand architecture, they don't understand it. There, there's always nuance and there's always things that are sussed out through that dialogue. Um, so the same goes for interior designers or designers. Um, many, many of our projects don't have them. And it used to be that if we had one, I would not necessarily be that proactive about really collaborating with them, but then I've come to realize, well, this has tremendous impact on the work in the end. So, so whoever it is that has sort of a hand, creative hand in what the project is in the end, I try to have, I try to make sure that I know that we can collaborate with them well and that they embrace that. They're not just putting up with us, but they, they're embracing the collaboration and that we follow through and we, we do that. You know, we don't just say, you guys take care of this and we'll take care of this. It's, it's a dialogue. Yeah. Terrific. 
Well, if there are any more questions, raise your hands or type I, them in the chat. I, I have one. <laughs> right. to, to someone's earlier question about working here in New England, could you make us all really jealous and tell us what the widest door opening you've been able to do? The widest door. Oh, the widest like the door. widest door that slides oh, slides out and yeah. opens up. Uh, hmm. Uh, it's probably. It's funny. We've done a bunch that are forty feet. So like we've hit like some. <laughs> we've hit like. A so it's probably like forty-four feet or something like that. Forty. At a certain point, it doesn't. It's just like I more, know. you know. And you're trying to move too much glass out of the way, so it's it's burdensome. That's and wider than the side of most of our houses. <laughs> What's that? That's wider than the side of most of our houses. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like you know, some lots in Venice aren't forty feet wide. So, um, but it's probably around forty-four feet. Is my guess. Yeah, that slides away. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But what it seems like the key to your architecture is not the width of the opening or the size of the opening, but that you're bringing materials from the outside in and blurring that line. It doesn't matter the size of the of the line, but you're blurring the line. Yes, I, I agree with that completely. So it can be a very small aperture to a you know, like it might not be anything, but sky like a Terrell space, right? Or it might be a beautiful, um, you know, whatever tree um, that we're looking at or a beautiful dry garden or something. But yeah, it's not, it's not about how wide it can be. Yeah. Sure. Wow. Do you, so what are you reading right now, Takashi? Oh. Put me on the <laughs> spot. You on the spot. This is a library talk. Yes. <laughs> Uh, hmm. Fiction, well, what did fiction. you last read that you really enjoyed? Well, I haven't read this yet, but I just got this, which is um, this little book uh, called How Much House. And I'm guessing it was done by this professor at Texas Tech or UT. I can't remember. But anyway, it's a little meditation on Corbusier's cabin, Thoreau's cabin. And then what I'm guessing was the result of a studio done at UT. So it's called How Much House. So I think it's kind of a meditation on like, you know, whatever, what, what the essence of, 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 of dwelling is, which is pretty much, you know, like what I'm trying to get at, right? So, yeah, so that's, that's, that's on the top of my stack. But my stack is always like, it never gets shorter. Just it's probably like yours, Anne. It's like there are too many good books out there to. Yeah, so Tim will say it isn't just the one stack. Yeah. <laughs> you pick your stack and see how yeah. high it is. Yeah, that's yeah, true. There are stacks in multiple rooms. Right. Yeah. yeah, they never get smaller. So, yeah. um, if there are no other questions, Takashi, thank you very, very much for an incredibly lovely show, but also. An, a magnificently articulate presentation of your thoughts um, and the progress of architecture that you're making out in LA and California. And now I hear Aspen. So, um, you know, there has to be a line somewhere at the West that you've stopped and you don't come any further East because I know <laughs> there are going to be some nervous people out here. <laughs> uh, always but, welcome. Uh, yeah, well, you're always welcome to visit, that's for sure. No, uh, and work. <laughs> Please come and say hello whenever you're in New York. Uh, we oh, look forward to, to that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And thank you all in the audience for attending. Uh, we look forward to having uh, Austin, Texas's Nick Deaver uh, on the Essex Library stage on January 8th uh, at 7 o'clock. So watch for the register link for that on our website quite soon. Uh, Takashi, again, thank you very, very much. We look forward to your Committee on Design efforts. Uh, if not in 2021, then in 2022, and we'll we'll see you as soon as possible, uh, hopefully before 2022. Thank you. I look forward to that. Yeah, Everybody, thanks. happy bye. holidays thanks, and stay thanks. well, and take care. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for That's coming. Bye. 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 That, was fun. that was fantastic. Thank you, Takashi. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.